Well, hello. Welcome back to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Uh, if you've been a regular watcher, uh, don't forget we are also on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, on each of those, it's at uh, North Star Oasis. Uh, welcome. So, we're coming into the summer months. We are hopefully past all of this uh, cold, rainy, wet kind of weather that we've been facing recently. Now the sun has come out, and I'm so glad to know that you're st sitting there watching us uh, today on uh, your uh, local cable television show or on YouTube. So today we are uh, going to remind you, as we do every, every chance we get or every episode, that we have 208 shopping days left until Christmas. Uh, that's pretty much a standard. We let you know that uh, throughout the year that we're hoping to give you many, many ideas on your Christmas list. And it's never too early to start thinking about the next Christmas shopping season. I mean, why have the rush on Christmas Eve when you, know, you could just start thinking, hey, you know, it's 208 days. I better start thinking about getting my loved ones some presents. And so here's what I'm going to do. But in the meantime, uh, I also remind you that we have um, 85 weeks before the next presidential inauguration and it, I make sure that we specify the inauguration instead of the actual election because that is when the changeover occurs and we know that President Obama will not be re-elected because he's not running. Uh, he is term limited out per the U.S. Constitution uh, and the amendments process. So as we look ahead um, you know, we're, gonna, we're looking every single week at a different presidential candidate. But before we get into that, uh, what came across my desk uh, just before we began the show, literally about four or five minutes ago, was a story that uh, came up about the creator of Barack Obama's Hope poster, a famous poster in uh, 19, uh, came out for the 19, or the 19, the 2000, uh, eight election. The headline reads, Barack Obama Hope Poster. Po Poster's creator says Obama has come up short of expectations. And I'll just read one paragraph quote from uh, Shepard Ferry, uh, who says, not even close. Shepard Ferry answered when uh, asked by Esquire magazine if President Obama has lived up to the Hope Poster. Obama has had a really tough time, Ferry said. So the poster's artist said that President Obama has come up short of expectations. And so it should not be uh, that much of a surprise to anybody that, you know, people are already looking forward to that next presidential election cycle, uh, mainly to get through it. So that being said, we have so far covered Hillary Clinton's uh, announcement as we have with Ted Cruz. We're trying to take them in the order in which they announced. So we had Hillary Clinton, Ted Cruz, uh, Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, and Ben Carson. So now we are up to Carly Fiorina, who was the CEO of Hewlett Packard for, for a number of years. And she has announced that she is running. And so with that, we are going to show her presidential campaign announcement. I'm getting ready to do something too. I'm running for president. Our founders never intended us to have a professional political class. They believed that citizens and leaders needed to step forward. We know the only way to reimagine our government is to reimagine who is leading it. I'm Carly Fiorina, and I'm running for president. If you're tired of the sound bites, the vitriol, the pettiness, the egos, the corruption, if you believe that it's time to declare the end of identity politics, if you believe that it's time to declare the end of lowered expectations, if you believe that it's time for citizens to stand up to the political class and say enough, then join us. It's time for us to empower our citizens, to give them a voice in our government, to come together to fix what has been broken about our politics and our government for too long, because we can do this together. Now, Kali Fiorina has had uh, some decades of business experience, and uh, she reminds me more of 
H. Ross Perot, who ran in 1992, without being uh, considered the nut job. So let's take a closer look now as to what Kylie Fiorina has on um, her stances on issues. The war on women, uh, I, look, I, I don't have two hours. You don't have two hours to explain all of this, but what, what's the highlight here in terms of what you want to get across to folks? If you run for president, what are you going to tell people? What are you going to say about this? I think women in particular turn off of the political process a lot because mm. they don't like the tone, they don't like the vitriol, they don't like the sound bites. But I also think that particularly on the subject of life, and I'm staunchly pro-life, as you know, yeah. the Democrats have used this issue to scare women to death. And sometimes, when men talk about this issue, it seems a little scary to women because mm. it seems judgmental. So one of the conversations I have with women all the time who may not agree with me on the sanctity of life or may not agree with me that life begins with conception is I talk about facts. Mm -hmm. So did you know that the DNA in a zygote is precisely the same DNA as the day you die? Hmm. Did you know that the Democratic Party platform, because people always say the Republican platform is so extreme, I say, have you ever read the Democratic Party platform? No one's read it. Did you know it says any abortion, any time, at any point in a woman's pregnancy, for any reason to be paid for by taxpayers, and now they want to add, to be performed by a non-doctor, mm. a policy succinctly described as it's a life when it leaves the hospital. How do you feel about that? No one agrees with that. That's extreme. Or I'll say to a woman, how do you feel about the fact that a 13-year-old girl needs her mother's permission to go to a tanning salon but not to get an abortion. What do you think when you go into a bar and the sign says, warning, drinking may be hazardous while pregnant? Who do you think it's hazardous to? Mm. What do you think when we're conducting in utero surgery at 16 weeks? Sounds like a life. In other words, <laughs> there's a way to have a conversation about even this issue, which I feel strongly about, mm -hmm. in a way that's not judgmental, it's not scary, it's empathetic, mm -hmm. but it gets people to start thinking differently, perhaps, about this issue, and in particular, differently about how extreme Democrats are in a way that the vast majority of Americans don't support. And I'm just taking a quick look right now at Rasmussen Reports. Uh, today they issued their, uh, what the, reviewing last week's po key polls, what they told us. Several of the biggest issues facing the nation are in court or on the way there. I'm just, this is the first time I've actually looked at it. Um, just trying to see if they have any polling on the presidential race. Uh, but they do say that 27% of likely U.S. voters now think that the country is heading in the right direction. 27%. So that's 73% who still think we're heading in the wrong direction. Um, and then the president's daily job approval ratings remain in the mid to high negative teens. Uh, and again, this is coming from Rasmussen Reports. This isn't anything that I've just thrown out of midair. Uh, the generic congressional ballot, Republicans 38, Democrats 38. Uh, and unfortunately, we do not have a chart, so I'm just reading uh, some basic headlines that Rasmussen put together. But uh, that just shows you the state of where we're at in this country. And so now, let's see Kali Fiorina as she makes her case for president. Early. Thank you. Great to have you. me. I've chaired major charities in this country as well. I know most of the world leaders on the stage today. I understand how the world works and who's in it. I do understand bureaucracies. That's important because our government is one big giant bureaucracy. I understand technology and technology is a tool that can be used, as I said, to reimagine government and to re-engage a whole set of people who in this country feel disconnected from the political process in very serious ways. And there's certain things you have to do to move bureaucracies. One, you have to know where your money is being spent. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any idea how our government spends money. We don't ever look at a budget top to bottom. We need to actually go to zero-based budgeting so we can prioritize how money is spent. We really have no idea what's going on in our government. Zero. 
And so I think we need to reimagine government and the process of government with modern technology in mind. I think the Oval Office is, among other things, about making executive decisions, which are tough calls and tough times with high stakes for which you're prepared to be held accountable. Well, you know, you can't buy every domain name. You just can't. Maybe we should have tried, but we didn't. And so, you know, people are going to do what they're going to do, but um, hopefully people will go to carlyforpresident.com instead. And then, of course, when you manage through a very tough recession, there are some tough calls required as well. And, of course, everyone else in the technology industry had to make some of those very same tough calls. Well, first, as I intimated earlier, I would uh, roll back the 400 pages of regulation that the FCC just published over the Internet. It can't possibly work. The FCC is a vast bureaucracy. And think about the non sequitur of having 400 pages of detailed rules and regs over the Internet. I mean, it's ridiculous. Secondly, there is a um, bill that it's wending its way through Congress right now called the Innovation Act. Wow, sounds great. Who isn't for innovation? But when you think about the process of Congress passing a very complicated bill written, frankly, by big companies, what's going to be the consequence of that? It will be harder and harder for small companies to innovate. It will be hard. What the consequence of all complicated regulation? is that the big get bigger, the powerful get more powerful, and the small and the powerless have a harder time. That's just a fact. And that's why we're now destroying more businesses than we're creating. Uh, for the first time in U.S. history, we have more small and new businesses failing because they can't handle the complexity. And so I think one of the very important things that we do in the most innovative industry we have in this country, where we are still leading in the world, is to start to peel back all of this bureaucratic, complicated overlay that government somehow is going to manage the innovation in this industry. It's a complete non sequitur. You don't manage innovation. You let innovation flourish. What government should be doing instead of rolling out vast, complicated regulation, what you know, government should be doing is investing more in basic platform research. So as we've heard in uh, previous, um, previous news cycles for the last few years about uh, Hillary Clinton always saying, are you ready for a woman president? Well, I think if you compare Hillary Clinton and Carly Fiorina, I think a vast majority of Americans would probably say, yes, we are, and we will choose Carly Fiorina over Hillary Clinton. But that's the head-to-head -head matchup that we really need to be watching uh, between Hillary and Carly Fiorina, two women, both uh, distinguished in their uh, capacities, and both are going to be going head-to-head -head here, and that's going to be a fun contest to watch because they're ideologically opposed to each other, but yet, uh, the women vote does matter. If, if female votes, they do matter in an election process. And um, so this is going to be an interesting um, thing to watch in the uh, upcoming election cycle. Uh, however, now let's take a look, though, if, um, you know, what happens if Hillary does not make it through the primary? And what does that say about the uh, capability of Hillary? What if neither of them make it through the respective party's primary processes. It will definitely then be a male-dominated uh, general election cycle, although I will say that, at least with Carly Fiorina, that if she does not make the general election, because that is a wide open, the Republican side is wide open, there is a lot of candidates running this time around. And here, we're taking candidates one, you know, one a week, and yet, just when we think we're getting caught up, then the next batch of candidates from both parties, uh, they, um, they uh, start declaring. So we still have even more to get us through the summer. Uh, but we, you know, with Carly Fiorina, she's really experienced. She's got a lot going for her. And that's the good thing. Uh, then we take a look at Hillary. Now, if, if Carly Fiorina is not deemed ready, is Hillary Clinton ready for president? I mean, she's only been running for the office for 40 years. Uh, but that's, again, 
we're just going to say that this is going to be an interesting matchup. And I would have to say that it would be kind of fun to watch Carly Fiorina versus Hillary Clinton in the general election. But uh, at this point, what difference does it make? Moving on, we're going to take a look at one of the things that we continue to look at, uh, and that is, because uh, we've got a bunch of storylines that we just keep you up to date on if you've been a regular watcher of the show. And a couple of new things have come up about the, the protection of elephants in Africa. First of all, the bad news, poachers, this came from the UK Guardian on Tuesday, uh, poachers killed half of Mozambique's elephants in five years. Uh, reading the story here, poachers have killed nearly half of Mozambique's elephants for their ivory in the past five years, the U.S.-based Wildlife Conservation Society said on Tuesday. A Mozambique government-backed survey showed a dramatic 48% decline in elephant numbers from just over 20,000 to an estimated 10,300, the WCS said. The, uh, this decline is due to rampant elephant poaching in the country's most important elephant populations. The WCS said, remote northern no Mozambique, which includes the Nissa National Reserve, was the hardest hit, accounting for 95% of elephant deaths, reducing the population from an estimated 15,400 to an estimated 6,100. Uh, elephants are prized in Asia, where they are carved into ivory statuettes and jewelry. Across Africa, up to 30,000 elephants are estimated to be killed illegally each year to fuel the ivory trade. An estimated 470,000 wild elephants remain in Africa, according to a count by the NGO, non-governmental organization, Elephants Without Borders, and that was down from several million a century ago. So as part of our story, no elephants in uh, circuses may mean no elephants at all. And I have said before in a previous episode of this program that perhaps opening up the ivory trade, uh, regulating the ivory trade instead of destroying the ivory, the illegal ivory that has been, uh, that has been captured might actually do less harm and more good for the elephants than what we currently see. However, on that front, uh, another Ga Guardian story that came out yesterday, China agrees to phase out its ivory industry to combat elephant poaching. Uh, they've committed to phasing out the domestic manufacture and sale of ivory products for the first time. Conservation groups said that the announcement was the single greatest measure in the fight to save la the last African elephants from poaching. In an event in Beijing where foreign diplomats witnessed 662,000, uh, excuse me, uh, 662 kilograms of confiscated ivory being symbolically destroyed, uh, Zhao Shukong, head of China's State Forestry Administration, said, We will strictly control ivory processing and trade until the commercial processing and sale of ivory and its products are eventually halted. Now, China is the world's largest. Uh, single demand on ivory products, but again, this is only going to fuel the black market and, ri and raise ivory pr uh, prices even higher. Uh, but w there is some good news on the um, ivory poaching uh, combating front, and we're going to take a close look at a, a short look at a video. Mathematics and drones may be the best hope of saving these elephants and this rhino from extinction. We take into account both the model of how the poachers are attacking the animals as well as a model of how the animals naturally move through the park. This new effort links predictive analytics with drones to spot illegal activity in African game preserves. The computer program builds on the same algorithms developed to forecast locations of IED weapons caches in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Lindbergh Foundation's Air Shepherd program approached the Institute for Advanced Computer Studies at the University of Maryland, where the original military code was written. And where this has been tested, it literally stops the poaching. Uh, for the first time, the poachers don't own the night. Some African game preserves are the size of Connecticut and impossible to patrol on foot. So the program predicts one day in advance where the animals will be and where poachers are likely to strike. And we found that within uh, a week of starting our flights in these areas, uh, the poaching had stopped. Previously, 
It had been anywhere between 17, 18, 19 rhinos killed in this area a month. Uh, for the past six months now, it's been zero. The fixed wings drone flies a pre-programmed night flight route based on the hard data. The drone is equipped with infrared cameras that send a real-time visual data stream to a command team in the field. Pre-positioned park rangers can be alerted to any suspicious behavior and surround an area in minutes. And what you're constantly doing then is creating this, this very synergistic data set of where the people on the ground who are covering these areas and driving them every day, either as wardens or taking tourists around, are inputting this data, and so every day the model gets better and better and better. Based on the program's success, Air Shepherd plans to deploy additional local anti-poaching teams in the near future. Tom Ritchie, Associated Press. So, the uh, unilateral opposition to drones, that's clearly ignoring many major benefits that we're seeing uh, that are playing out within the world. It's, uh, drones are a tool. They can be used for bad. They can also be used for good. And let's, you know, when you hear more about drone policies, you got to keep that one thing in mind. On Monday was Memorial Day. Where were you? Did you just sleep in, have a cookout, and ignore what the holiday is all about? Or did you show up at your local cemetery and pay a tribute and homage to those who had uh, died in military service? We were at Elmhurst Cemetery in St. Paul, uh, right off of Dale and Larpenter Avenues. And here's what happened there. A chair, you're more than welcome to have a seat. Welcome to our Memorial Day service here at Elmhurst uh, uh, Cemetery. You know, at, at times it can be very easy for us to forget why it is we're here. I'm going I'm to step out, I can't see you all. <laughs> um, at times it can be easy for us to forget why it is we're here. Uh, it's easy to forget. Uh, when we get busy with our lives, busy with the, the work schedules that we have, the, the families that we have, the, the different hobbies that we enjoy. It's easy to forget when we can freely go and, and, uh, and worship at church every Sunday morning, when we can uh, travel freely from state to state without any passport or checkpoints. It's easy to forget when we listen to radio programs and watch television programs that freely use that, that freedom of speech that we enjoy. It can be easy for us to forget why it is that we are here. I think that's, that's maybe a reason why our forefathers uh, in America, they, they put up uh, memorial, uh, different, different uh, memorials around the, 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 the United States. They put up statues to, to remind us of the different sacrifices that people have made throughout the years to give us the freedom that, that we so very much enjoy. Some of the, the newer uh, memorials that you'll see around the United States have uh, little statements on them, six little words that really, really encapsulate why it is we're here. They say, uh, all gave some, some gave all. It's a reminder that some people gave their entire lives to die and, and died for the freedom that we enjoy here in America. Not too far from here, there is a, a memorial uh, to the soldiers and sailors. In, in New York, there's that Ground Zero Memorial. It's a reminder that we will continue to fight for the freedom that we have, even against the enemies that will attack us on our very own soil. 
Those memorials are important. They're reminders of the sacrifices that people gave for our freedom. Our forefathers put them up because they knew how easily we can forget. But you know, not only our forefathers knew how easily for, for we forget, but also our, our God, he knows how easily we forget as well. We forget that he wants us to be people who show love, and yet, more often than not, we have uh, feelings of, of anger and hatred that really build up in our hearts. He knows that we forget that he wants us uh, to be giving of the blessings that he has given to us. And yet, we have those feelings of, of greed and envy that really fill our hearts as well. He knows that we often forget. You know, it reminds me of a, another nation. The nation of Israel, at its very beginning, was a nation just like us, founded under God. And just before the nation of Israel went in to take the land of Canaan, God used his servant Moses to leave them with this message. He says, don't forget the Lord your God. He knew it was going to be easy for them to forget. And so he left them with that warning, don't forget the Lord your God. And even though they had that warning, they still did forget. And because of that, the Lord used foreign armies. He used other nations to come and punish them, inflict uh, harm on them. You know, God could do the same thing with us. For the times we so easily forget who he is, to forget to keep him as a priority in our lives, he could be done with us. He could just cast us into the pits of hell. But he doesn't. In his love, he sent his own son to make that ultimate sacrifice. He sent Jesus to, to give it all, to die, so that we can enjoy freedom from sin. He gave it all just for you and me, and he does more than that, too. He leaves us with memorials as well, with reminders. You know, there are countries around the world, there are places around the world where people are suffering and dying just because they, they worship the God that this country was founded under. In the Middle East and in Africa, people are losing their heads because they worship that God. But here in America, we have the freedom to open up that book, that memorial, that reminder that God hasn't forgotten us. Every church you see, every cross you see is a memorial. It's a reminder that God hasn't forgotten you. But he has given his own son to pay for your sins. Memorials are good things. They're reminders. They're reminders that we shouldn't forget. You know, one of the, the things that, that happens on Memorial Day is a, a very good reminder to not forget. Uh, in the morning, the flag is raised to half-mast as a reminder of the people who gave their lives, who sacrificed their lives for our freedom. But then at noon, that flag is raised to full mass. And that's a, a reminder that we should continue to raise their memories. That we will continue to raise up people who will continue to fight for the freedom that we enjoy here in America. Friends, don't forget. Remember the freedom that you have, that so many people have died to give you. Remember the freedom that God has given you. We continue. We continue. Let's, let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance then. I pledge allegiance. We continue with a reading of Freedom Is Not Free uh, by Greta Krieger. I watched the flag pass by one night. It fluttered in the breeze. A young Marine saluted it, and then he stood at ease. I looked at him in uniform, so young, so tall, so proud. He'd stand out in any crowd. 
I thought how many men like him had fallen through the years, how many died on foreign soil, how many mothers' tears, how many pilots' planes shot down, how many died at sea, how many foxholes were, sol were soldiers' graves. No, freedom isn't free. I heard the sound of taps one night when everything was still. I listened to the bugler play and felt a sudden chill. I wondered just how many times that taps had meant amen when a flag had draped a coffin of a brother or a friend. I thought of all the children, of the mothers and the wives, of fathers, sons, and husbands with interrupted lives. I thought about a graveyard at the bottom of the sea of unmarked graves in Arlington. No, freedom isn't free. We will now hear a memorial address by a retired major, Chris Fields. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this morning I want to start by thanking all who have worn the uniform. And I really thank you for uh, showing up today and acknowledging this day and uh, really uh, taking your time to pay respects to our fallen uh, comrades. Uh, I want to thank Jerry, uh, the director. Uh, he's done a good job of putting this on year after year and it really is something special for uh, those who served uh, that someone takes the time uh, to make sure that this day is special for us. Uh, and thanks to the 4th Congressional District Republicans, Michelle Mankey and Jim Carson, uh, your efforts are very well appreciated uh, this morning. Uh, I thought I'd start uh, the address uh, by just reading a letter, uh, a Civil War letter uh, written by a uh, person who had served in the legislature in Rhode Island and later uh, joined the army to fight in the Civil War. Um, he was a Union officer, his name was Sullivan Ballou, and he was assigned to the Grand Army of the Potomac, or Potomac. Uh, July 14th, 1861. This is a letter he wrote to his wife. Dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow, and lest I should not be able to write again, I feel compelled to write a few lines that may fall upon your eyes when I am no more. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage neither halts nor falters. I know now how American civilization now leans upon the triumph of our government, and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. I am willing, completely willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. Sarah, my love for you is deathless, and it seems to bind me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence can break. Yet my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly with all those chains to the battlefield. The memory of all the blissful moments I have enjoyed with you come crowding over me and I feel most deeply grateful to God and you that I have enjoyed them for so long. And oh Sarah, how hard is it for me to have lived and loved together and seen our boys, excuse me, to give them up and burn to ashes the hopes of future years when God willing we may still have lived and loved together and seen our boys grow to honorable manhood around us. Sarah, if I do not return, never forget how much I loved you, nor that when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will whisper your name. Forgive my many faults and the many pains I have caused you, how thoughtless, how foolish I have been at times. But Sarah, my dear Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flint unseen around those they love, I shall always be with you in the brightest day and darkest night. Always, always, and when a soft breeze fans your cheek, it shall be my breath or the cool air upon your throbbing temple, it shall be my passing spirit. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Think only I am gone and wait for me, for we shall meet again, my dear Sarah, we shall meet again. 
Captain Sullivan Blue wrote that to his 24-year-old wife who uh, died when she was 80 years old in 1917, never having remarried. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that Captain Sullivan Blue and the soldiers, sailors, and Marines, and airmen that were before and after him did not risk their lives for the GI Bill, foreign travel, retirement plans, or health care plans, health care benefits. They did so because of their great love of country. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is only 10 sentences long. In it, he uses the word here eight times. The word is not only used to specify a location, but also to mark a specific moment in time. As I stand here, I submit that every service member who was laid to rest right here and in other consecrated grounds came to a specific moment in time when they realized, just as Sullivan Blue realized, just how important their family is and how equally important their love of country is and all the sacrifices that have been made by the men and women who have worn the uniform before them. When those service members reach that moment and they decide to go forward on the battlefield and fight for their country, if they should happen to lose their lives in combat, we call that the ultimate sacrifice. The ultimate sacrifice is remembered here and honored every day, but especially on Memorial Day. Right here on this day, we stand still and remember our family, friends, and loved ones who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Right here on this day, we stand still and pay respect to the families who have lost their loved ones. Right here on this day, we stand still and recall that there are some who have made the ultimate sacrifice who we will never get to bury. Right here on this day, let us resolve to recognize our heroes made the ultimate sacrifice so that this great nation will endure for generations to come. Thank you. We continue with President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, as read by Madeline Krieger. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power, to add or detract. The world will little know nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. We continue with the song, God Bless America. It should be printed on the right side of your service. Oh. 
continue with the decoration of the cross. Well, that was on Monday. Uh, now, for Memorial Day, you know, there's a lot of talk about when you go to Memorial Day observances, uh, with the exception of this one, on the origin of Memorial Day. And just looking up a couple of uh, things, there were some observances that occurred during the Civil War. Those were mainly localized in nature, and that was still during the war. But following President Abraham Lincoln's assassination, uh, there were a lot of commemoration events, and of course, as the uh, Civil War was winding down, uh, the first widely publicized observance of Memorial Day uh, after the Civil War occurred in Charleston, South Carolina on May 1st, 1865. Uh, during the war, Union soldiers who were prisoners of war had been held at the Hampton Park race course in Charleston. And at least 257 Union prisoners had died there and were hastily buried in unmarked graves. Together with teachers and missionaries, black residents of Charleston organized a May Day ceremony in 1865, which was covered by the New York Tribune and other national newspapers. The uh, freedmen cleaned up and landscaped the burial ground, building an enclosure and an arch that was labeled Martyrs of the Race Course. Uh, nearly 10,000 people, mostly freedmen, freed blacks, uh, gathered on May 1st to commemorate the war dead. Involved were about 3,000 school children, uh, newly enrolled in Freedmen's schools, as well as mutual aid societies, union troops, black ministers, and white northern missionaries. Most brought flowers to lay on the burial field. Uh, historian David Blight, I believe he's from Yale University, he uh, had written a book called Race and Reunion, which I had actually read. Um, and he had described that first day. This was the first Memorial Day. African Americans invented Memorial Day in Charleston, South Carolina. What you have there is black Americans recently freed from slavery announcing to the world with their flowers, their feet, and their songs uh, what the war had been about. They were basically, what they were basically were creating was the Independence Day of a second American Revolution. Now following this and other customs, 
uh, General John A. Logan, who at the time, uh, on May 5th of 1868, he was the Commander-in-Chief of the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, a Union Veterans Organization, and he had called for the first observance for Saturday, May 30th. And what is today? Today is Saturday, May 30th. So this would be the anniversary of the creation of the first uh, federally recognized uh, Memorial Day. And it was chosen as the optimal day for flowers to be in bloom. And memorial events were held in 183 cemeteries in 27 states in 1868 and 336 in 1869. Uh, the northern states quickly adopted the holiday and Michigan made Decoration Day, as it was called, an official state holiday in 1871. And by 1890, uh, nearly every northern state had followed suit. Memorial Day was observed on May 30th until uh, the Uniform Monday Holiday Act was signed into law on June 28th, 19, 1968. So 100 years after General Logan established the first nationally recognized Memorial Day, uh, Congress creates a bill. President uh, Johnson signed it into law. I believe it was Johnson. Um, yeah, 1968, um, and it took effect on January 1st, 1971, and it moved Washington's birthday, originally February 22nd, uh, Memorial Day, May 30th, Columbus Day, October 12th, and Veterans Day, November 11th, from fixed dates to designated Mondays. So now George Washington's birthday, now known as President's Day, is celebrated on the third Monday in February. Memorial Day is... Um, the last Monday in May, and then Labor Day, first Monday in September, Columbus Day, second Monday in October, and Veterans Day, the fourth Monday in October. But now, what do we do after we finished up at Elmhurst Cemetery? Thanks to the Paddleford Packet Boat Company, we took a cruise. And we're here on the Anson Northrup from the Paddleford uh, packet Boat Company in St. Paul, Minnesota. Today is Memorial Day and normally you would have a cruise like this going on for Veterans Day because Memorial Day is a day to honor the dead. However, in Minnesota as we know there's pretty much ice built up on the river so the Paddleford Company has been gracious in the last couple of years to allowing veterans and their families to take a free cruise on the Mississippi River and they actually run two cruises a day. So here we are on the Mississippi River. We're not too far from, uh, from Randolph Avenue and we've just been cruising up the uh, Mississippi River and just having a relaxing time. If you uh, recall your history, St. Paul was pretty much founded based upon the river boats and this was the major thoroughfare for anybody who wanted to get anywhere. It was either by horse and carriage or by boat. So here we are enjoying a boat ride.
and the signal was given to open the bridge. At this point, the old character pulled a corn cop plant out of his mouth, strolled up to the gathered the signal, and hollered to the bridge tender, don't you dare open that bridge. Of course, everyone looked at him in astonishment and asked, why? So he explained, well, if you open the bridge, it'll spring over my property, and I say you can't do that. Sure enough, a surveyor confirmed that the bridge would indeed swing over the old man's property. So the railroad people went back to him to resolve the situation. They assumed that his price had increased every day during construction. But, as the story goes, the old man looked at them straight in the eye and said, No, sir, gentlemen, the price hasn't gone up a penny. Now the railroad officials were truly confused. So he explained, I'm an old steamboat man who would put out a job on the railroad and I wouldn't sell my land to you for any price. And he's confirmed. As a result, they had to cut off a giant piece of the bridge on the left and balance it with a huge block of concrete to shorten the swing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a true story. Well, most of it, anyway. Oh, it says. And we're here with Dione Ohakwi, U.S. Army veteran from 2009 to 2014. Dione, so this is your first time on the Mississippi River? Yes, that's my first time in the Mississippi River. It's a nice cruise. So, uh, what do you think of the Paddleford Packet Company? Oh, it's a very nice experience <laughs> going on a cruise, remembering our fallen soldiers, and it's really uh, a time that we reminisce on things that we've gone through and again trying to remember the fallen heroes. So it's not a day for the living ones actually, it's for the dead ones, but then we still thank God for the good things they have done for us, keeping us alive. And then the fact that you can just sit back and relax a little bit gives you a chance to reflect? A lot. You know, you sit back and think your time, your service time in the army, in the force, and you really want to like say thank you God for everything he has done for you at least for you being alive and having an opportunity to serve the country that's the most important stuff now did you deploy overseas anywhere yeah I went to Afghanistan 2012 to 2013 how does it feel to be home oh, man. <laughs> that's the best experience you can have <laughs> coming back to your hot shower being with your family eating on the table with your family it means a lot Speaking of family, you brought yours here today? Yeah, I brought mine. My mom is here. My fiance is here. My brother. All of them are here. So I took them on the cruise. Are they enjoying themselves? Oh, they are so much. They are. They're enjoying themselves. As a matter of fact, they're eating hot dog. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for your service and good to see you today. Thank you so much. Thank you.
and here we are just uh, we're still on the Anson Northrop and we are just over the engine room and you know, this place just rumbles it's really loud uh, most of the passengers are on the Betsy Northrop which essentially is a floating barge uh, with seats and tables and nice place to relax but back here we're hearing the rumbling of the engines now back in the steamboat era you wouldn't hear the diesel engines that we have obviously there was no diesel engines built at that time but we would this would have been where the paddle wheel would have been especially if it was on the stern wheeler and we would be seeing a whole bunch of steam and spray uh, coming off from right behind where I'm standing now and so steamboating or bo river boating has changed over the years but this is still a throwback to the days gone by And that's our show. Uh, blessed Memorial Day. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.